Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Happy Hour Live webcast from WhiskeyCast.com. I'm Mark Gillespie, and it's Friday, June 4th, uh, what would have been the closing weekend of this year's Isla Festival. This would have been uh, Buna Havin's day today. And uh, of course, Ardbeg's day is tomorrow. Uh, sitting here sipping on some uh, Ardbeg 10-year-old. And let's uh, bring in our guest right now, Ardbeg, Col Ardbeg's Colin Gordon, the uh, distillery manager there. I keep wanting to say Mickey because Mickey Heads was manager <laughs> there for so long. But uh, I, I know I, I, I you took over for Mickey a while back. Yeah, yeah, I did indeed. Nice to see you, Mark. Uh, thanks for having me. I, yeah, I was just saying, I still get Mickey's fan mail in the door. I think it'll take a wee while to get used to it. But uh, yeah, yeah, I've been here now since uh, 1st of October. So uh, eight months in the door. It's been quite a journey, but absolutely delighted to be in here. And uh, what a fine man to take over from a true gentleman and whiskey legend, Mickey Head. So delighted to be part of the team here now. And this is your first art beg day tomorrow, even though it will be virtual. Uh, yeah. What all do you guys have planned? Well, we've got a, a lot planned. I mean, it's, it's a shame that we can't welcome people in, in person. It's always such a great day. Even when I, I didn't work at the distillery, I was always here at our beg day, enjoying uh, the day, the music and everything that was going on, the fantastic whiskies. But we're going live tomorrow on ardbeg.com. We are through the day loads of different stuff the theme is scorch our big scorch which is uh, our bottling that we've done is all around uh, dragons and sort of a uh, mythical uh, theme so lots of stuff we've got an interactive map where you can go around the island and, and and see lots of clips and tastings and i'm doing a live tasting myself just towards the end of the day five o'clock our time um with uh, david blackmore from uh, our brand ambassador over in the states so uh, I'm really excited. It's it's even though we're we're not here in person, there's great excitement. There's a real buzz building for tomorrow. And uh, I can see out your back windows. It is still daylight there, even though it's uh, ten o'clock at night. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, it, at least it doesn't look like it's raining too much. We've actually, you know, this is becoming a re a reoccurring theme now. We're uh, we have a really dry May into early June, so. Last week we were up at the loch just making sure water levels were okay because it has been quite dry, but ah, now glorious, glorious sunshine and sun always shines on our big day, so we'll be hoping for the same tomorrow. What all do you have? What time do you get started? Because I know you said earlier you've got a, a tasting with some folks in Hong Kong. What time do you have to get going in the morning? Mm, I need to be here for eight o'clock tomorrow morning, and uh, we have two young girls, two, two young daughters in the household, so I'll need to do some fatherly duties first before I can uh, escape, I think. So it'll be an early start tomorrow morning, but it'll be a sprig of the step. Looking forward to it. Obviously, it's got to be a bit different this year with no in-person events, but there are people on the island this week, even though the uh, the phage events are all virtual, right? You've had some people yeah. nosing around at least, right? Yeah, I mean, UK-wide can sort of travel again. Um, and the self-catering accommodation reopened at the end of April into early May. So we have people, the, the visitor centre here is closed still. It doesn't reopen until next week. Um, but even though two signs at the gate saying closed, casks up at the car park saying closed, we're still getting people coming down asking for bottles. <laughs> but that's just the way. And, we, we, you know, we're a welcoming place, so we don't like we don't like to turn people around. But... Uh, there are now people starting to appear back on the island, yeah. Uh, and, you know, we, we've missed people. It's, it's, it's part of what we do. We, we love making great whiskies and we love sharing them with people. So it's nice to see people back. But, uh, yeah, it's been, the, as you know yourself, the strangest of years. So it'll be nice, nice when we can open the doors again. How long has it been since you've been off the island? Oh, I actually went off last weekend. No, not last weekend. Two weekends ago we went off and... But before that, we'd had a long spell. I think the longest I went without going off the island was 11 months. So that was quite a long time. My family, I'm from Perthshire originally, sort of um, the Southern Highlands. So it was, it was, you know, it was nice to get back across the road, but we've been fine. It's a beautiful place to be, island. We're very lucky with uh, where we were, keeping ourselves uh, safe <laughs> here on the island. Um, but it was a long stint. It was certainly a long spell without going off. 
have a question for you from Dave Kuhn. He's curious how life has changed for you since you moved from Lagavulin over to Ardbeg, besides having to uh, go just a little bit further down the road now. Yeah, I know. It's just a mile and a half up the road uh, extra. Um, it's, it, it's, been, it's been a whirlwind, to be honest. I, I, I had a, a great eight years uh, I did with, with Diageo and uh, working at Lagavulin for the, the last couple of those years. Um, the the role here, uh, I always loved, loved the site, and you know it was it's such an iconic place and a, a beautiful place. And there's great excitement, the opportunity to work with whiskey creation, Dr. Bill Lumsden and the team. So uh, uh, this was always the role I thought when Mickey would come to his retirement date that I would I would try and get my feet in the door. So I was absolutely delighted to get in. I think. It's been it's been strange in a way because we've come in just as the still house our big when I came here we had built the new still house but it wasn't commissioned we were just waiting to finish COVID it sort of held it up and it's literally about a sort of day handover I had with Mickey we walked around and he just said this is the new still house this is what you need to get going so the pressure was on from day one but really tight team here really really good team and. Uh, working with them has been an absolute pleasure so it's it's mainly really focus has been on the project and making sure the spirits bang on and that we're happy at how we're running um, and just getting the sort of projects tidied up sort of meeting the team and getting settled in but it, it's flown by it actually it feels like a lot longer than eight months we've been here it's it's, it's, it's flown by but yeah it's been it's been busy tell us about the new still house because this is really sort of the first big expansion that we've seen at Ardbeg since it opened, reopened for good about 20 yeah. years ago. Yes, it's, it's a huge change. I mean, in what, 206 years old, the site, and it's always been one wash still, one spirit still. Um, and the decision was made back 2017, 2018 to, to build a new still house and to double up. Um, so move up to two wash stills, two spirit stills to give us a bit more capacity and just future proof the uh, the site as well, the, the old still house had great character, but it had probably uh, seen its day in terms of um, compliance and space, etc. So built a new still house, incredible building, a uh, huge big glass window, uh, which looks out onto the bay and these beautiful four stills. And uh, yeah, it's a huge, huge change. I came in actually on the night shift. So we first ran Spirit uh, 19th of March, I think, 19th or the 20th of March. And I came in on the night shift. I wanted to see the first spirit come through the safe just as we were commissioning. And it was crazy, you know, for the guys that have worked here for 30 years when they're talking about spirit still number two and wash still number two. You know, that's never happened before. So there was such a buzz about the place. And they took to it so well, the commission and the team here. They, I, I couldn't thank them enough. They were brilliant because it was a massive change. And, you know, it's an emotional thing as well. We're all, you know, you're very you live and breathe whiskey and these guys are they're so passionate about what we do here at Ardbeg and the site it was a big change um, but they've, they've taken to it really really well so I'm delighted how it's gone. Let's uh, go off, off of this with a question Chris Ratcliffe asked and let's talk about the commissioning process for a new steel house what all is involved in getting it up to speed and making sure that the spirit is consistent with the original steel house. Tell us about that process of commissioning. So the key thing is obviously ensuring the spirit quality remains and the, the challenge that you, you're always going to face with a new still house, even if the still has been designed exactly the same, so same shape and um, you know, well, same shape right down to nut bolt and rivet of the still, Pipe runs might have changed, you know, distance from um, stills to the safe might have changed. So it's all about ensuring that we were happy. So even if you're say your cut points where you're going to be on four shots and spirit and faints, they might need slightly tweaked because you've got a slightly longer run or a shorter run. So we did quite a lot of work around that, uh, making sure that we were we were happy. And also the, the whole control of the stills has changed because you've got old stills, old pans uh, in the old still house. The guys knew like literally all manual exactly where they needed to set the steam as you're bringing in the still and then running uh, through the uh, through this, the distillation. 
here we're in a brand new still house, new heating elements. So there was quite a bit of tweaking the first few runs, very, very gentle, very slow, because clearly you don't want to just, you know, um, rush the still in. You don't want any entrainment, any coming over the top. So we were very gentle, really finding that sweet spot of how we run the stills to make sure that, you know, nothing comes up over the top and we're getting that perfect run because same, the spirit stills here obviously have purifiers that uh, feed back into the still to give you lots of reflux we want to make sure that we get that reflux we don't just again push over that run these stills too hard so loads of stuff the first few weeks of, of commissioning just to make sure that we were we were we were happy and things were bang on so um yeah we had a really again good team good support with us and working closely with uh, dr bill uh, and the whiskey creation team making sure they were happy as well. Just a quick point of clarification. Does this new steel house replace the original or is this in addition to the original? It's it, it's, it's a replacement. So the old stills are still there. Um, the old still house is still intact, uh, but we don't have any plans just now to uh, to bring it back. So you never know. If, our, <laughs> if the hard bed growth continues, maybe in 15 years we'll be, we'll be getting those two stills going again if we need to. But... Uh, for the time being, the plan is just to run the new stills. But it gives you a place you can take the tourists through the old still house. Yeah. And yeah. not interfere with the uh, operations in the new one. Yeah, absolutely. But we, the plan is still to run, to take people through the new still house. It's absolutely beautiful. And uh, it's quite interesting because when we move to the, the new still house as well, there's little, um, like little things that the guys had in the old still house, like, the way that the pipes were painted and things and they've replicated that because i suppose this new still house will be history one day as well so they've, they've sort of made it their own but yeah you can still walk through the old still house before going to see the new one and chris wants to know just a, a follow-up how do you match the spirits and what strength do you cut your new make down to as a uh, comparison guide so in terms of what, when we're nosing it, what do we, we bring it down to or, or the actual cut points? Sorry. Um, what, we, what we do when we are uh, running the stills, we will cut um, at well, 20 degrees Celsius. We will cut it between 74 and 75 uh, percent ABV. Um, and then we'll run spirit. Spirit runs normally about four, four and a half hours, and then we'll go on to faints about 62 and a half, 63 at uh, 20 degrees Celsius, just to make sure we're capturing some of the that tail end as you're moving into the faints, the big, heavy, phenolic notes. Um, when we are nosing, so when we're comparing the samples, because that's what we did when we ran four shots in the new still house, we sampled every minute. I mean, clearly the first minute of your four shots, you're still rinsing through the faints from before. So you certainly wouldn't want that going in with your spirit. But we sampled it and then we diluted everything down to normally about 20% ABV for nosing. Um, and actually we've got Bryony on site as well. Bryony, whose father Rooney is uh, on shift. He's one of the uh, stillmen here. Uh, Bryony used to work with Dr. Bill's team. <laughs> And she's now come home, so it's a very handy person to have about. She's got a fantastic nose, so we, she, she helped us out a wee bit as well. Dave Kuhn referred to uh, your transition and uh, seeing you a couple of years ago at the Fage when you were taken over from Georgie at Lagavulin. Yeah. Tell us about the process of moving from one distillery to another. When you go from Lagavulin, which is equally unique in its own special ways, to Ardbeg, Tell me about the transition from one distillery to another and having to learn the intricacies of that new distillery. Yeah, it's, it, I think one of the big differences really with Ardbeg is we're a lot more manual. So um, Lagavulin had um, sort of more automation, which I, I, I don't think takes away from anything at all. The guys there are just as passionate and know the process inside out. Um, when I first came to Ardbeg, just spending time with the guys in, in, in the mash house and the mashing was a lot more um, a manual intervention. So it was really good just to see that and they're, they're just they're on it, you know, literally they're watching everything. It was, it was very, very good. The other big difference really coming up the road is, well, at Lag of Woolen, we obviously had the, the iconic uh, Ian MacArthur, uh, head warehouseman, Ian MacArthur. I think he's about 53 years service now, still no sign of retiring, he's some man. Um, 
he was really the only warehouseman. He he filled the, the new make spirit was tankered away to uh, the casks were all filled on the mainland. Here at Ardbeg, everything's done on site. So all warehousing uh, operations, the filling and the disgorging. So even if we've got some casks on the mainland, they'll all come back here to be disgorged. Um, and that was completely different for me. I, I have like spent a lot of time in obviously the Maltons, but in distilleries as well. And that side of the fill and disgorging, I've done a wee bit of warehouse operations, but um, that was a big change. So, but again, brilliant. That's it's, it's like I'm a whiskey romantic at heart. So to be filling every cask on site, I love it. And it was uh, spent a bit of time with those boys as well and made sure I filled a cask as well. <laughs> I didn't want to just be standing watching, but uh, yeah, it, that was that was really different and, and great to see. So what did you do with that first cask that came off the uh, new stills in the new still house? Uh, we've done a few things. Uh, watch this space. So uh, we had some good chats with, uh, with Bill Lums and with Dr. Bill just uh, about what we would do. I mean, clearly we've marked everything. We know exactly what cask were the first ones. And uh, yeah, we'll watch this space. I'm sure there'll be something exciting in the future done. A long time from now. I think probably a good while, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back and just sort of run through your history for, fo for, for folks who are not familiar with your career, because before Lagavulin, you and I first met when you were managing the Port Allen Maltings for Diageo. That's right, right, yeah. Before that, where were you before that? Well, I, I did... Um, I, 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 well, whiskey, uh, my very first job in whiskey, actually, I, I was a tour guide at Edward Dower Distillery in Perthshire, where I'm from, in Pitlochry. Uh, that was well, that's about 16 years ago now. I just did a summer job and I, I really liked whiskey and I did a summer job there and I just thought this is incredible because we've got this amazing science going on. And at the time, there was probably, I don't know, 100 distilleries in Scotland. Everyone's using three ingredients and the range of flavours just blew my mind. So I just fell in love with whiskey. Ended up going to Heriot Watt in Edinburgh to do a brewing and distilling master's a year course, as so many in the industry do. And then Diageo, I went in as a trainee manager. So what they would do is they would rotate you uh, round. So you would do like nine months secondments working for different people. Um, and I worked at Burghead Maltings as my first placement. I was desperate to get into a distillery and they put me to a Maltings. But it was important. You needed to learn uh, what was going on. And then I was at a meeting one day and I said, I'd like to go to Isla. And uh, they were a bit surprised. They said, oh, not many people volunteer, which I couldn't believe. I thought there'd be a queue wanting to come to Isla. But uh, my, uh, at the time, girlfriend, now wife, Rosie, she's from an island just near Oban, so she was keen to come west as well. And I went to Kalila for nine months. And at the time, Billy Stitchell was manager. What experience. Unbelievable, 40-odd years, knew every nut and bolt. What a guy. So I sort of worked for, with Billy for a while. And then up to Speyside, and I finished at, I did a bit of Inchgower, and then Rose Isle Distillery, which at the time was quite new, 14 stills, well, massive, 110,000 litres in the washbacks. It's a massive, massive site. Um, and then obviously signed off my training and came to Port Ellen Mall, and so moved back to Isla. Um, I was keen to get into a distillery, but great grounding at the mall, and you're providing mall for... Uh, at the time, it was, well, there were eight distilleries at the time, I think. So six of the eight distilleries were taking malt from Port Ellen. Lots of challenges, lots of peat. Really, really good, though. Uh, excellent. And then the opportunity to come to Lagavulin. Uh, I did two years there. And then that's me settled now. We're not going anywhere. We're in, <laughs> we're in the door at Ardbeg, and that's that'll suit me down to the ground. So um, I think my wife would kill me if we moved house again. So we're well settled. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good question from our pal Bob Winting at Maltstock. With Ardnaho, Port Allen, which isn't going to come online till 2023 now, and uh, the Elixir Distillers project that Georgie's yeah. working on now coming yeah. into action, and with all the production increases, what challenges do you face, if any, as an Isla distillery? That's a great question. Um, we tend to work pretty close together, and I think we recognise the challenges um, as a collective. That's one great thing about the Isla distilleries. We, the managers especially tend to, to get on and work quite closely. Um, I think there's definitely challenges about energy. Um, 
we're all clearly moving to be greener and it's a big focus of the business um, LVMH, who, our parent company, and so making sure we have supply and looking at the future renewables on the island and how we can really work together as, as a collective to push things forward. I think there's always challenges around transport as we get extra distilleries on. There is draft leaving the island, yeast coming on the island, casks moving back and forward, bottles as well, um, and malt. Um, and ferries and making sure that we could get everything here so there's always good discussions about ferries and and I think just another thing that, that really is is going to be a challenge is um, recruitment we have um, a lot of the distilleries have older populations of, of workers and it's important that we keep um, our youngsters here on the island it's their great jobs and lots of people want to get into them but there's challenges around uh, housing um, and a, you know, in affording housing, it's a popular place to be, Isla. And um, so there's challenges around that. But I think the future is very, very bright. It's, you know, there's, there's great confidence in the industry, especially single malt Scotch whisky, and especially Isla single malt Scotch whisky. And um, yeah, I think the future is really bright. I think uh, there'll be lots of good stuff to come. How hard is it to attract new talent to come to the island if you don't have a lot of housing for them, but there are jobs? Yeah, that's that is one of the big challenges. And you know, um, Elixir, who are who are building the distillery, uh, Sir Kinda Singh, that Georgie is, is is going to go and run for uh, Sir Kinda. Um, that was one of the big questions. Um, uh, you know, I believe when they put that to planning, uh, and you know, there was an expectation that they would have to build housing, because and it, it's it really is crucial. And I mean, all distilleries had houses at one time. You know, Ardbeg here had lots of houses that sadly came down in the 60s and 70s but uh, the, there are challenges but um, lots of people want to come and they're great jobs you know Isla's incredible for that you'll know yourself Mark when you walk around yeah. people wear like their distillery badge like it's uh, like a football top or something Do you know everyone wears their badge kind of with pride and there's like family links to distilleries and they all show off in the clothing and a lot of people want to be involved with them so yeah, it's just making sure we can keep them here. Yeah, I would live on Isla in a heartbeat if I yeah. could. It would be, uh, it's just a place I have always loved. Um, Dave Kim wants to know, uh, what's your wife doing if uh, she's not handing out water on the three distilleries path uh, during the phase this weekend? <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, uh, she, we've got two, two, young uh, two young daughters and uh, she was... As part of the mother and toddler group in Port Ellen, they were handing out uh, <laughs> handing out water um, to make sure that everyone was, you know, okay. Because it's there's th well, three distilleries on the path. will soon be four, and uh, they were making sure that they'd had suitable uh, refreshments and selling bits and pieces. So I know it's a shame. It's a missed opportunity this year because you can't do that virtually. But uh, yeah, she's uh, she's excited tomorrow. I think. We're obviously closed, but we're, we're you know we'll we'll gather in the afternoon uh, some some people and maybe try and have a barbecue or something if the weather's good. We'll see how we go. So we'll still enjoy the uh, the yard bag, even though she won't be able to dish out the water. And people will smell that uh, barbecue, and they're going to come tearing through those barrels and the gates and everything to see what's going on. You know. Yeah, I don't think I don't know if we'll do it here. <laughs> I think yeah, absolutely. There'll be people looking over the wall. Let's continue with the malting discussion. Chris wants to know what's inside the Port Ellen maltings. He's heard it described as a giant tumble dryer. And is there a grain pipeline from the dock to the maltings? Uh, we did a video piece on the maltings several years ago for a Whiskey Cast HD that uh, you can find on the YouTube channel that Colin features in from when you were manager there. Yeah. But give us sort of a sense of what the uh, inside of that maltings is like. So the what you're uh, or Chris is describing here is the giant tumble dryer is the germination drum. So at Port Ellen Maltings, there are um, it, it's there's three levels, if you like, sort of three mezzanine floors in the main building, and on the very very top you have the steeps. So the steeps are big, um, like um, like conical steeps they call them. They look like a like a funnel. And that's where the grain goes with the water to be steeped to make sure it um, takes in moisture. You want to get the moisture of the grain up to about 45% water. So they're in there. You obviously don't hold them underwater the whole time because you'll end up drowning the grain. So 
hold them under water, drain the water for an air rest, and then wet them again. And you do this either two or three times to get the water up in the grain. And then they drop down into these big, huge drums, big germination drums, huge cast iron um, germination drums. And when they built the maltings back in 1974, that was the technology of the time. And it's like, it's obviously, when you're malting, or if you go to a traditional maltings floor, as that grain is starting to germinate in the roots and it's just starting to grow, they'll end up just uh, locking together. So they obviously the traditional way would be with a shovel, you know, you would go and turn the grain. You can still see it at Beaumore and, and Laphroaig and, and Kilhoman as well. Um, but these drums, when you've got 50 tonnes of malt uh, growing, you're going to need a big floor. So the technology in the early 70s was you drop it into these big drums and every Oh, crikey, I'm racking my brain now. Every 10 hours, every 12 hours, the drums would would turn very, very slowly to turn the grain. So that's what, and there's seven, there's seven germination drums at Port Ellen Maltings. And then from there, they go next door into the one of the three kilns uh, to be dried uh, with heat and peat smoke, of course, to get the the, fen the phenols and uh, the smoky the smoke sticking to your husk. Um, the other question he, he was asking there is about, is there a, a route for the grain to get from the, the boats, because obviously all the barley yeah. that's malted and I was brought in, or at the maltings, is brought in by boat. There's not, um, it get, goes into a big silo and then lorries move it up to the maltings. So maybe there's future work to be done there, because that's still the same way as it was <laughs> in, the, in the early 70s for bringing it into the maltings as well. Now, I got a great question a couple of days ago on Facebook from a listener, and with your malting background and distilling background, you're the perfect person to ask this to. <laughs> From Tim Walker, has anyone tried drying grain via refrigeration? I didn't take biochem in college, so I'm not sure what happens to the enzymes as they get cold, but I do hold a degree in refrigeration and know that cold air can dry things out quite well if done properly. I'm curious as to what this process of drying would do to the final product. Hmm. Interesting concept. I knew you couldn't get peat into it because you got to no, burn the peat to get the smoke. Yeah, that's but, what I'm thinking there. I, 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 you know, obviously, lots of people do dry via refrigeration. That's an interesting concept because it's an energy intensive process drying grain. Um, but the issue you're probably you're going to have is the peat smoke. So when they're when they're drying in the kilns at the maltings, they will. I think the the whole process of drying took anywhere between about twenty two and twenty. Well, even up to 30 hours sometimes, depending on how wet the grain was. And you would burn peat for 16 hours. And it was never to provide heat, it was just the smoke. So you would that fire would always be dampened down. You wouldn't you wouldn't want flames breaking through, you would just want the smoke. Um so that would probably be your chance. But it's an interesting like, there's there's loads and loads of good stuff happening around energy and, and looking at ways so I, I, you never know it's it's maybe something that could be looked at but peat smoke is going to be your biggest challenge i'm wondering if it's more energy intensive to cool things off than it is to heat them up because once you cool it off you got to keep it cool yeah and that's where you use the energy like a, yeah. an ice rink or an ice maker uh that because that's one of the challenges when you're drying the green bed as well because the very early stages of, of drying, free drying, when all that moisture stuck to the husk, you actually don't need a huge amount of heat. It's, a, it's, it's, it's airflow. So the fans will push. Um, say you, you set your, your burner, if you like, or your temperature to 45, 50 degrees, just by pushing your fans really um, hard, you can dry off a lot of the moisture. It's the last, probably last, 15, 16 hours of drying where you need lots of heat, probably up to 75, 80 degrees to dry the grain, but or dry the internals of the grain. But the other the other issue you're going to have as well is lots of malts. Now, not so much pot still malting that the maltings on Isla does or, or Lafroy or you know, they'll probably finish at about anywhere between 75 and 80 degrees. But if you're wanting to make a chocolate malt, say something like that for Signet or, or uh, sister distillery up at Glen Morangy, you're going to want that a lot hotter because you want to start almost burning uh, the husk of the grain. So you couldn't do that with drying. So hey, it's, it's, I'm not I'm not going dis, to dis, disregard it completely. I, I could see an idea for it in some cases, but I think to do it at scale, you'd wind up using more energy 
than you would with fire. And as uh, Dave points out, fire came well before refrigeration for a reason. <laughs> Absolutely. Graham Frazier had a question, and I know Bill wanted to do this with the changes at Ardbeg. Any chance of a floor molding coming back to Ardbeg in the future? Bill's been talking about this for years. Uh, yeah, again, you can, I'd never say never. I mean, the, as I say, the company, incredible the investment the site's seen. Um, I actually saw some old pictures from 97 uh, uh, when Glenn Morangy bought the site. It, it, it's just the changes in the, the spend and um, is incredible. But you know, they've invested heavily in uh, a big uh, the lighthouse project at Glenmorangie, which is the sort of uh, innovation plant, if you like. And the you never know what's going to happen. There, there's currently no plans, but uh, you never know. Why? With my background, we could, I'm sure, if something that came in the future, we could we could look at it. But currently, it's it's not in plans. But I have heard Bill say in the past that it wouldn't be a bad idea. And Graham Frazier wants to know, how will the new steel house impact on new single malts down the road? Obviously, we're looking at uh, increased availability, theoretically, sometime at the earliest 10 years from now for uh, something like the uh, Ardbeg 10-year-old. But uh, at some point in the future, you're going to have some more juice to play with, right? Yeah, the, the, we're still quite limited in the fact we've now increased distillation capacity, but fermentation capacity is still quite limited. We've only got eight washbacks. So we have increased slightly the amount of mashes going through in a week. Um, but we really need to get a couple of extra washbacks in to, to be able to make uh, more. We're still pretty small scale. I mean, last year we were about one and a half million litres of alcohol we made. Even if you built as you know enough washbacks to maximize production here with the size of the still house, you'd probably be about 3 million liters, which is probably similar to similar to Lagavulin just down the road. So, it, but it does give us more juice and that's key because that's been one of the big challenges uh, with our deck is the demand has grown. We've got absolute diehard fans, you know, a huge, huge following and a cult-like following that absolutely adore what we do, which is um, one of them. But uh, we want to make sure we can lay down some older stock as well because as the demand for ten and things have gone up, you know, ten years ago we were really not making a huge amount of, <laughs> of spirit at all. So it's making sure that we can uh, future proof and lay down so we can see some more uh, older or different versions in the future. Our pal Tyrone Cote in Nova Scotia, what are you laying down today for <laughs> Art Big Day 2031? Well, we were well, we've had a brief discussion about uh, 2022. 2031, I don't know, we'll have to do something new stills, I don't know, I'm not sure, but I'll tell you what, it'll be an exciting one, he'll need to get his flights and accommodation booked now for 2031, it could be a big one. And Pete had, uh, sounds like an announcement for Ardbeg 2, first uh, new still house, need for new mash tons, what else do you need at the place? No, well, that's us, that's us, I think uh, the guys... You know, I've only obviously like we've just talked about being in the door eight months, and there's been a lot of uh, a lot of building work going on for the guys that have been here for the last sort of five six years, and um, there, there, there's been a lot. So I think we just need to get projects finished and just make whiskey and settle down. So I think uh, I think that will be us project wise for a while. Um, rather be on Isla says, well, you guys could actually use a new old kiln cafe. Actually, I'm not sure. <laughs> does Jackie need a new cafe? Oh, well, we've just actually got a, one of these art stream um, uh, trailers, you know, they, and they've just kitted it out to do some sort of street food style. So we have expanded dining options, um, and that's that should be getting fired up soon. So when you guys come back over, yeah, there, there should be something, something else cooking. And this is a tongue-in-cheek question from Dave Kuhn. He wants to know <laughs> if you get along with Shorty. You can only get along with Shorty. He's an icon. He's an absolute hard big icon. He's but pictures of him everywhere. <laughs> From what I am told, though, uh, all you have are pictures because Shorty actually, the real Shorty, kind of actually passed on a few years ago. From what I'm told, yeah, Shorty. According yeah. to Blackmore, the yeah. real, the original Shorty. The original Shorty. What you need? Well, do you know there was talk a while ago about a Shorty too. And maybe a distillery dog. Uh, but yeah, the original shorty, 
Um, Emma, who works in the visitor centre, Emma McFarlane, her husband, it was their family dog. They're from our big, just up the hill. And uh, it was their family pet, little shorty, the Jack Russell. So he did pass on a, a wee while ago, but the legacy lives on. So we're, we're, we're big fans. We sort of asked this before, but Chris Ratcliffe wants to know, what are the first things you went looking for when you got to Ardbeg? Uh, looking for some of those uh, really special casks in the warehouses, things like that. Uh, what did you get Mickey to show you that maybe he was the only one who knew about? We did walk the warehouse and, and um, Dugga, Douglas Bowman, who's our head warehouseman at D2. So my day with Mickey was great because we walked about talked about the projects and about the history and just the amount of changes he'd overseen and the, the second uh, day of my sort of handover we walked with Douglas Bowman with Dugga into the warehouse and um, warehouse three the, sort of the main Dunnage warehouse we have on site and um, yeah he showed me a few crackers I was looking out for them though because it's you know I love my whiskey and I hadn't been round uh, the, <laughs> warehouse number three so Anything that was like 197, you know, caught my eye pretty quickly. And um, there was, there's some great cast. And there were so many, you know, because we play about renovation and wood, there were some in, really interesting casks in there as well. But yeah, it was one of the first things I went looking. A wee, a wee poke around the warehouse is, is a must do when you come to a site. I had a uh, chat yesterday on a uh, distill tasting with your colleague, Brendan McCarran. Yeah, Brendan, yeah. And uh, Brendan said yesterday that. He did check with Jackie to make sure he still gets the uh, Ardbeg employee discount at the gift shop. <laughs> he's got some cheek that man. <laughs> no, he's yeah, a, yeah, I know. He's some man. He's a good friend of mine, Mr. McCarran. Now that's it. He's nice, some boy. But uh, ah, yeah, he's, he's always welcome. Always welcome here. I'm sure he'll be well looked after when he comes through the door. And uh, I'm not sure about this name. I think it may be Evgeny and uh, I. My Russian is not very good, but greetings from Moscow. Thanks a lot for a brave decision to put that five-year-old age statement on the We Beastie label. Thumbs up, great marketing. I know that wasn't uh, your call, but uh, that five-year-old We Beastie did not taste like five years old to me. Yeah, it's, it, I was talking about this earlier. It, I remember trying the, the PT pathway, the, the, the whole, um, you know, very young, still young, almost there, um, which was launched in sort of the mid 2000s um, as the stock started to build um, after the 97, uh, sort of getting the site back up and running. And something about Young Ard Beg just works beautifully. And there's always, a, because we do a lot of bottles at Ard Beg and we don't put age statements on, and I think, you know, historically people have looked at non age statement whiskey and thought that's probably three years and a day old. You know, there was always this sort of um, a bit of suspicion about them, but some of the non-age statements we bottle are, are, are way, way above that, above, way above the five-year-old, a lot of them as well. But with the wee beastie, it was about showing that young Ardbeg, that real vibrant, fiery smoke soup, but lots of big fruits, lots of the distillery character as well, would be a, a great success. And we wanted to put the five years on to show that 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 is unashamedly a, a young hard bag, and it's 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 a cracker. I'm a big fan. I love wee beastie. Well, a lot of people remember back in the uh, late 2000s, a few years after the distillery opened, the series of uh, hard bag, young, very young, still young, almost their releases. Mm. And those were really good, too. And those were in the five to seven range. Yeah, uh, yeah. Graham Frazier says most of the recent committee releases have been no age statement. Is there stock available for aged bottlings in the future? How do you, let's turn that question around. How do you balance the need to have stuff available for the 10 year old and the older bottlings while still keeping whiskey available for the future? Yeah, that is that is one of the big challenges and that's part of um, the whiskey creation team who look at whiskey stocks because um, if we, you know, we could probably could bottle everything as ten year old and, and put it out the door, such as demand. So we have to we, we have to try and find that sort of um, happy medium. Um, so uh, there's a lot of bottlings that we'll do non age statement that are above the ten year old as well. Um, but we're always kind of looking and keeping some aside, and a lot of it's all led on the cast that we put aside. So we've already started picking next year's bottlings, so we. We roughly know um, the 
the ones set aside that are a 10 year old, if you like, is ring fenced and it just makes it a bit easier. Um, but demand is still still flying up for it. I just want to pull this comment from Tabitha Spirit Bomb in, in uh, Southern England. I went to pour a dram of art bag and I'm horrified to find out that I've drunk it all. Time to order some more. I've been reduced to drinking an eight year old single cask Talisker tonight. And uh, some of the guys in the chat room are giving Tabitha some grief. Not a bad alternative, but you should be ashamed of yourself for <laughs> running out of hard bag. Um, <laughs> things like that. Um, and from Pete Head, hold on tight. Better days will come. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hopefully, we can get some hard bag to you. And uh, Dave Kuhn says, we know, and Mickey. Loved all the yard bags, but Ugadal was one of his favorites. Have you picked a core favorite yet that you like, or oh, are they like know. the kids? So it's whichever one you're, whichever one's behaving the best at the time. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I've said a few things in here, and people said that's very like Mickey. Do you know, it's funny. I'd, I'm not no word of a lie. The core range probably Ugadal is my favorite. I, I love ten year old. Like I, I, I vividly remember the first time I tried our bag ten. I remember Dave Broom. Uh, the whiskey writer describing it to me as soot and fruit and i love that description of 10. i think it's it's a beautiful balance that sort of real limey citrus thing going on with it as well but there's something about Ugadal. um i just it's rich it's um, like smoky chocolate and pine needles or something it's just it's there's so much going on with Ugadal. but uh um, yeah so i don't there's lots and lots of like that probably if i had all in front of me Eric Ross, watching from Alaska tonight. Any chance we'll get a Manzanilla cask finished soon? Maybe an Ardbog too. Once watch, again, I know that's a that's a Lumsden decision. Yeah, watch watch the space. That's always Bill's answer, isn't it? Watch the space. You never know some cracking Manzanilla cask finishes. I mean, we we do a lot of re racking on site, so we do lots of uh, playing about the woods. So perhaps even, even in my eight months here, so quite a few Manzanilla casks getting filled. So let's see what happens. We are getting requests for uh, the Dark Cove. Um, Dave Kuhn saying, make, hashtag make more Dark Cove. Um, and yeah. people supporting that. Uh, <laughs> what a whiskey. What a whiskey. Dark Cove's a sensational. Topic. Yeah, so uh, we definitely need some more Dark Cove. This was a cracker, too. Uh, yeah. Any chance we might get some more of this coming? Well, again, we fill in lots of different types of casts. Let's just keep an eye on it. I, again, Dark Cove. And it was a great day here at the festival day, the whole smuggler theme bit. Oh, what a drab. Dark Cove, sensational. Brilliant iron bag. I'm just hoping that because I have just a, <laughs> like a, maybe one dram left in this one. I can't think of anybody I'd rather sh drink it with. Good man. Colin, um, let's I just. I've got a with Dark Cove, actually. I don't think I'm just having a look what's on the tasting shelf beside me. I don't know if I've got a dark cove up there. We're killing the heel for this one. Farewell to the dark cove. Oh. Um, Bob, Bob Wenting, our buddy at Malt Stock in the Netherlands, not without self interest. Will you be doing any traveling for Ardbeg? Uh, when do you get to hit the road? And I guess the question we have to ask Bob is you know, are we going to have Malt Stock in September? Uh, I, will, I hope to come in. You know what? It's. It's amazing being able to come over and, and, and meet people and, and share the love of our bag. So, yeah, I hope so. It um, just depends on what happens with restrictions. But uh, I, I know Mickey did not do a whole lot of traveling. Are you going to try no, to do more? I or? Um, yeah, I hope so. I mean, like I say, we've got uh, two, two wee girls, so I can't abandon, uh, abandon the household for too long. But, yeah, I hope so. I mean, it's uh, – like I say, there's so much great stuff going on in the markets. I was speaking to you know Cameron and George earlier, one of our brand ambassadors in the states, and he, uh, you know, he's always doing some great events and funky stuff over in the states. So yeah, let's hope we can get out there sometime soon. And Dave Kuhn is so jealous right now because he saw us pouring <laughs> somebody pouring that dark cove. Um, Tyrone Cote, his favorite special release over the last five years was Black. Yeah, you have black. to say it that way because there's like three A's in there. That is, but yeah. uh, the uh, new with the New Zealand cat wine casks. Yeah, right? Pinot Noir casks. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like um, we, we tend to get a lot of like, really nice uh, estery fruity notes in our big uh, new make and something about the Pinot Noir cask I think amplified it was like berries, you know, uh, black currants and stuff like that. Incredible. 
yeah, I'm seeing incredible for everything. That's uh, that's all down to Bill and the team. They're genuinely everything they put out is sensational stuff. Our pal Valerie Bradshaw in uh, Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada. Back in 2014, she went to an Ardbeg Galileo tasting. Um, other wines have gone into space since then, and the Galileo did not go into space, but it was some samples of a heavily painted whiskey that Bill had done some research on that yeah, went the space station for a while. Yeah, three years. It was years, sort of exactly. the first whiskey in space. Yeah, but, uh, yeah it was a vial, a vial of, uh, of New Mexico, but it went up for three years, and it was sort of surrounded by oak uh, to get a maturation. Then they did a taste. But yeah, it went up to the International Space Station, and then Galileo was bottled... Um, and then obviously Supernova as well had a, it was uh, that 100 parts per million really heavily peated um, well so uh, was, yeah we, we were leading the way with that I think yeah and Bob Wending responded good question on malt stock in a couple of weeks we'll know I'll keep you posted fingers crossed Bob I really hope that uh, we can get to the point where malt stock can happen this year um it would be a shame to miss it two years in a row. But if we have to because of COVID, we can wait and do it one more year if we have to till next year. Great question from Ben Marnock. His son has applied for a trainee job at Ardbeg's bottling plant in Livingston. Do you have any advice for him starting out in the industry? Yeah, that's uh, good on him. I wish him well. Um, I, I think it's it, it, whiskey's a great thing to get excited about and you know, a, the bottling hall, whether you're um, malting or bottling or maturation, distilling, it's all about showing passion. So if he works hard, you know, expands his knowledge and uh, comes and visits us and going more into and really gets stuck into what the industry is all about, it'll hold him well. L just listen and learn. And uh, I worked for some great guys and girls that uh, taught me a lot and just by opening and watching what was happening around you. So show that passion and interest in you. You'll be, you'll be absolutely fine. And uh, great advice in almost any career is just to say half as much as you listen to. Open your mouth half as much as you open your ears and uh, you'll do well. Um, Chris Ratcliffe brings up, you mentioned passion, and there are few groups of whiskey fans more passionate than our beg fans. Uh, as we've seen from <laughs> yeah. the committee bottlings and the lines outside the distillery at the phage and people even coming around and trying to knock down your closed signs this week. What do you think of the Ardbeg fandom so far? I mean, I know Mickey is still technically in charge of the committee, but yeah. you're going to be the point guy here in a couple of years. What have you seen so far that's uh, oh. led you to believe that uh, you've stepped in as the uh, deputy chief of the cult here? Yeah. Oh, there's some, do you know, I remember, um, one of the first art big days I came to a few years ago, and there were, I think there were, oh, I think one of the guys was Norwegian. I think the other boy might have been from Scandinavia too, and they were comparing art big tattoos. They both had the A, and I thought that's absolute dedication. There's quite a few people I, I've met with with art big tattoos, but honestly, one of the first things when you walk into Jackie's office next door, <laughs> there's a picture that somebody sent in, and it's it's um, like six guys all holding a bottle of whiskey. They're totally naked. And they're holding a bottle of whiskey to cover themselves and uh, all holding a letter from our bag. And they just sent it in, just diehard fans and thought that we might appreciate it. <laughs> so that's not something you see every day getting sent in. And that's hanging in Jackie's office, right? Uh, I just, yeah, it never made the wall in here. In fact, I don't think it's even, it's just, she just turned, someone had sent it to her, it just made me smile. I mean, it's, it's dedication to go that far. And Tabitha Spirit Bomb, is there an official name for an Ardbeg fan? She thinks we need to call them something other than the cult of Ardbeg. I've heard them called Ardbegians quite a lot. Actually. Yeah. Some, yeah, the Ardbegians. Maybe we could come up with some names other than the cult of Ardbeg. Mm, uh, Dave Kuhn, there's an oasis connotation to the distillery campus at Ardbeg because of the location out at the end of the road and the fact that the old malt kiln cafe is there and it's the food is so good. How much consideration is given to the menu or food options there? Because it's a, a must visit when you're on the island. I know that, Yeah. I think the last time I was on the island, we were there. Yeah. No, it was the time before that that 
I remember being at the cafe with uh, Serge Valentin yeah. and uh, Gordon Homer and some folks when the power went out during a storm, <laughs> which happens on Isla. But uh, the cafe is great. What goes into that? Is that all Jackie? Do you guys get some input on that? How does it work? Yeah. No, not really. We, we we leave that to the team. So that um, Andy is the sort of head chef in there, and he works alongside Jackie. So they are, um, yeah. I mean, they, they make some absolutely brilliant food, and oh, there's they're actually. I got to taste some of the. I don't mean to make people jealous here, but some of the new menu they're hoping to do for this art stream trailer, and they've done beef brisket in a hard bag whiskey, like they sort of you know soaked it and marinated it and. Was making me hungry actually, but uh, so they put a lot of thought and, and effort into it. And oh yeah, when you walk to the end of the path, get to our big few drams and some great food. It's uh, it works a dream. People love it. And Chris Ratcliffe wants to know how often you've had the Clooney dumpling from the cafe. <laughs> if he worked there, it'd be every day, maybe more than once. The cafe really hasn't been open, really. It's been closed. The pandemic, right? It's been closed. So it's been it's been shut for fifteen months. Um, and obviously, when I started in October, we, that was it. We we tried to restrictions allowed us to meet outside on just before we shut down for Christmas. And the guys came in, guys and girls came in and did some food. And then they were doing deliveries to the island as well, but no Clooney Dunkling, sadly. So I managed to have a little sample, but we've not been in full cafe mode for fifteen months. So um, there's the, 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 I think that's due when it reopens, we'll get some. Does that reopen this week along with the visitor center? They're just going to do this outside catering just now in this Art Street trailer, and then we'll see what happens with the cafe. So, yeah, just now it's they'll, they'll try and do outside. But the food, like I said, that beef brisket I had the other day, I think they're on a winner. I don't think we need to worry. Our pal Julie Trevison Hunter from the Scotch Whiskey Exchange Experience rather in Edinburgh wants to know what's the – ecological, a most sustainable practice at Ardbeg that you're most proud of? What have you guys um, done to uh, try to make the place a bit more sustainable? So there's been a lot of work going in around the, the new still house in terms of energy efficiency. So we've, we've got um, like a hot water recovery system off the wash still. So they run um, so the condensers, you can take hotter water off and that's been used for preheating, um, no wine and faints. Um, and the spirit stills, that's been a big change in you know, good energy savings. Um, there's there's quite a lot of stuff, and there's more to come as well. We're looking at quite a number of things. Um, but I'm really, really pleased with the way the new still house has, has come on, and, and you can see it already in the oil use on site. Um, but there's lots happening. Lots. We're very much embedded in the community, so um, even the whole sustainability piece, you know, I think we, we like to be involved with the community and donate and, um, there's lots of good stuff going on in the background, but uh, yeah, again, there'll be more to come. Let's talk about that community. How has the island weathered COVID? Uh, I know there was, a, as you've talked about, being locked down essentially for 11 months before you could leave the island. The real concern was that if even one or two cases had come onto the island, it could have wiped out a significant portion of the population, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean there was there was there was huge worry as there's been everywhere, but we have we have an, an older there's you know an, an older population as well on island on all the Hebridean islands, and I think when it when lockdown first came, there was there was great worry on the island, and I mean we shut our big shut for nine weeks, everything shut, distillery as well, um, so but the community really came together. There was like. You know, we were doing deliveries, food deliveries, and we formed like a, a COVID resilience fund to make sure people were being looked after and checked on, and even delivering like newspapers to elderly people that couldn't go to the shops. Myself and my wife actually, we did shopping for a couple just along from us that were shielding. So people, like we, everyone came together, and I know it's a bit of a cliche with I love it genuinely, the, the community spirit really did shine through. Uh, things have obviously got better now, and you know, sort of vulnerable and elderly are vaccinated. There was worry though about Christmas Barra, which is in the Western Isles, they um, had cases and it did rip literally within weeks, had gone up to about 150 cases. And there's only a thousand people on the island, and that really brought it home. So, again, there was a lot of worry, but we've got through it, you know, and, and people have, uh, have been really strong. Um, so, 
you know, hopefully if we're not far now coming out the other end. And uh, yeah, you, you see, you, you've seen a lot of great stuff and a, a lot of really a great kindness. See as well us like doing the food deliveries. The cafe here's been running doing food deliveries. They're not making much profit at all out of it. It's all just been to make sure we're keeping going and that people, you know, can make sure they could get some food and that and, and just you know get the opportunity to to try and help out. So even a bit of doorstop chats, Jackie and her team when they do the deliveries will be chatting at their at the doors for half an hour. So your pies might be cold by the time they come to you, but at least you've had a good chat and make sure you're okay. You got to keep the Isle of Telegraph going. Got to get the gossip yeah. around somehow. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The daily tanker. Yeah, that's it when the, with the lorry drivers. Valerie Bradshaw on the environmental considerations. Consumers hold the greatest responsibility because it's the drive to pick up one bottle of liquor at a time that has the most adverse effect on the environment. Solution, buy a case at a time. <laughs> oh, Valerie. This is our audience, gang. Eric Ross, are there plans to offer U.S. Ardbeg Committee members anything fun, such as Ardbeg swag, since we're unable to take advantage of the things U.K. committee members can? No, I, you'll I take what they give you and you'll like it, Eric. Come on. I'm well, I pleased can. to hear Eric's a committee member. I don't honestly know Eric, to be honest. There's um, lots of discussions just now with the committee and... You know, it's good. I mean, there's about 120,000 people in the committee, 130 countries. It's incredible, absolutely incredible. So, I, you know, I, I don't honestly know what's going to happen, but, you know, we want to try and make sure everyone gets the best experience and offers they can. But, you know, it's difficult demand far outstrips uh, the bottlings that we can do. So, but I hope we can and, do something for Eric. And, Eric, let me try to explain a little bit just because I've done the re ask these questions before they can't sell committee bottlings in the states because of direct to consumer requirements they have to go through the wholesale and retail chain but the advantage here is that you actually might have a chance to buy the committee bottlings through your local retailer instead of competing with uh, everybody on ardbeg.com ordering them from the distillery uh, plus the whole 750 milliliter thing was also an issue. So there were a whole bunch of those things. Now, um, Tabitha wants more of the more size bottles, those big 4.5 liter honking size party bottles. We've got some, uh, oh, sorry, wrong. I'm looking at the wrong side. Yeah, you've got, got a couple here. behind you there. Yeah, yeah, that's, there's an Aura Verdes there from 2014 festival. And there's the Ardbeg 10 as well. So. Uh, we've got a couple of four and a half litres here that uh, Mickey left in the tasting stock, so I like keeping them on the shelf. And Tyrone Cote, um, has Ardbeg thought to produce some post-COVID extra, <laughs> extra large jerseys? His Ardbeg cycle jersey seems to have shrunken a bit, perhaps too much hot water washing. Tyrone, I, I think we're using it's something else, but yeah. Well, I think me and Tyrone are using the same washing cycle because I've definitely got similar <laughs> problems at home. So, and Eric, I love it, laughing out loud, of course. Um, and uh, let's see here, Dave Kuhn. I know whiskey writer, not to be named. He who, yeah, the Lord Voldemort of the whiskey world had a big part in the spread of Art Begg's reputation. In those first few years, let's correct Dave on that, following the reopening of the distillery. Curious what the distillery thinks about that link. This is not a question. Yeah, it sure seemed like one to me, Dave. Uh, do you guys still play up the uh, sort of the history with the uh, he who shall not be named? Uh, we don't. It's the, the quote's not on any of the bottles anymore, no. No, we've, uh, we've, we've moved away, as I think quite a lot of the industry has. Uh, Chris Ratcliffe wants to know, uh, is there a scope for more core expressions or is five enough? And are there the ideas that keep coming up for certain finishes or an Ardbeg cream liqueur? I'm not, I'm not sure I buy that I, Yeah, I don't think it's in the pipeline. Um, the core expressions, obviously, we beastie got added last year. Um, and we'll just continue to review it and, and, and see how we feel. I know as well, it was, was relatively recent and... Yeah, there's 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 lots of good stuff going on and and, and looking at things. So again, you, you you never know. There there may well be uh, uh, you, there may be more to come. But uh, we've got a good good core range. Cream liqueur. I, I, I don't see I don't see Bill uh, pushing for that. I, don't, I think our our bags at uh, 
it's hard enough to get hold of. I don't think we'd be putting it in the cream or cure just yet. And somebody suggests, Pete Head suggests, Chris should go rinse his mouth for even suggesting an Ardbeg cream liqueur. <laughs> oh, dear, <baby. laughs> So before I let you go, because I promised we'd keep your time to about an hour tonight because you've got to get up early. Tell us real quickly about Ardbeg Scorch, this year's uh, phage bottling, and when it'll be coming out. It's out this week, right? Yeah, yeah, I believe so. So it's, uh, I've got a bottle here. So it's our big scorch here, um, 43%. It is matured in fiercely charred casks. So we're playing on the whole uh, dragon, uh, the myth of the dragon and the dragon fired casks. But it's all heavy, heavy charred uh, American oak casks, but refill casks. Um, Oh, it's, it's it's a beauty, really, really great, great balance. A lot of the that you, the, the, the sort of notes you would expect from heavy charred uh, American oaks, and almost like solid caramel, vanilla, and uh, a good bit of spice to it as well, and uh, that classic like earthy suit as well, classic hard bag. Delighted with it, really, really great whiskey. So tomorrow on our bag, well tomorrow our time, our bag dot com, we start at uh, midday. Uh, our time i'm um, doing a tasting tomorrow as well at five to six but yeah it's going to be all about the scorch you know true our big style so a bit of quirkiness i'm pretty sure i'll be getting dressed up uh, and, and of course it's pretty as part of the part of the part of what we do um but yeah really You're really not, are you wearing the shorty costume or the dragon costume <laughs> tomorrow i think it's a dragon theme I think I'd struggle to get into the shorty costume <laughs> <laughs> better that than the suit of armor right yeah absolutely absolutely well, Colin, best of luck tomorrow with the Ardbeg Day. And of course, people can tune in. And uh, I had the chance to taste a small sample of the Ardbeg Day version of Scorch, not the committee version, but the yeah. uh, the mainstream release. And uh, thought it was excellent. My tasting notes for it are up at the Whiskey Cast website. Okay. So, Colin, thank you for joining us. Have a great Cheers. time with your first Ardbeg Day tomorrow. And uh, Hopefully this time next year we can all be together back at the distillery again. Yeah, looking forward to welcoming, uh, welcoming everyone back. And great to see you again. Cheers. Thank you, sir. Okay, and we'll leave it with, uh, as Tabitha points out, whiskey cosplay. Love it. Oh, boy. And uh, Eric Ross, thanks for this broadcast. Art beg forever. No arguments there, gang. Um, Thank you again for joining us. Don't forget to uh, listen to the podcast this coming weekend. We'll have uh, Brendan McCarran, who was uh, uh, the whiskey maker or whiskey creation second stringer for uh, behind Bill Lumsden for Ardbeg and Glenn Morinchy. Now the master distiller for Distill for Boone Haven, Tobermory, Deanston, and Lichig will be on the podcast this weekend. And... Uh, have yourselves a good weekend. We'll see you next Friday night. Stay safe. If you need to, wear your masks, get your shots, and the sooner we all work together, the sooner we can all get back together and enjoy the water of life in person again. Slouch of all, y'all. Good night.